It took me a while, but I finally understood what was wrong with women. Men, no doubt about it, men are the problem. Sitting here in the shelter of the bus stop, smelling the old urine from the homeless people who sleep here when no one is around, I see all my mistakes, and they are crystal clear in the rearview mirror of my mind. I have about an hour so I can tell you about this piece of my life. My life right now is not at all what I hoped it would be. In fact, it is now a complete failure. I had to seriously reconsider my lifestyle and relationships with people. But I'm still relatively young, so I have a chance to improve. My biggest mistake was trusting men to do the right thing. None of the men in my history made the right choice. Truth be told, my idea of what's right is what's best for me, but apparently neither of them understood that. My other mistake was that I believed that other women would act in accordance with the rules and principles that, in my opinion, kept order in life. The other woman in the story shouldn't have just stepped in and taken my toys before I was done with them. So now I found myself on this awkward bus ride back to my parents, trying to rebuild my life in that rural town I was so eager to escape. I'm sure there will be gossip in this small town as soon as I get there. It definitely won't be the triumphant return I was hoping for, but it's not all my fault. I am a victim of circumstances. People are expected to behave a certain way towards me, and when they don't, I guess I don't make good decisions. Men have always said the same thing to me since I was a little girl. Oh, Katie, you're so beautiful. I would do anything for you. My name is Katie because that's my name. I'm an apple in a world of peers, and that sets me apart from others. Being an apple means my breasts are bigger than my butt. Don't deceive yourself. Look around. There are a lot of pears, but not enough apples. However, my long, naturally straight blonde hair and crystal clear blue eyes don't hurt me either. My dad always said that I was born for great things and that I would be successful in life. At this point in my life, there was only one boy, Ralph Jenkins. He was the cutest boy in school and therefore in the city. I became attached to him in first grade and never let him go. He wasn't as driven as I was, but he always played his part. When we got to high school and I became a cheerleader, he had to make the football team or lose me. He didn't really like football, so I had to motivate him to succeed. He was a striker, so I just told him that when he got the ball, I would be standing under the goal, and anyone who stopped him from reaching me could ask me out. This spurred him on because Raf loved me and didn't like to share. By his senior year, Ruff had more touchdowns than any other player in school history. He probably could have gone to college on a football scholarship, but that wasn't my plan. Right after graduating from high school, we got married and moved to California. Rafe was a very good carpenter and had a lot of part-time jobs around town, so he was able to help me put myself through college. There I earned an associate's degree in business and started working in a bank to gain experience. The first experience I had was that some people who worked at the bank spent more money in a week on lunch than we spent on rent. They wore nice clothes and drove expensive cars, not pickup trucks. In short, they lived the life I wanted. I spent a lot of time in school developing the right image and losing my southern accent. Now it was time for me to make my mark. I started asking Raf to drop me off a block from the bank in the morning and pick me up a block away too. That way no one will ever see me get out of his old truck. Raf was a good guy, and I loved him in my own way, but I never wanted anyone to see me in that truck. One of the bank employees liked me, and he began to help me become the person I wanted to be. I, in turn, helped him with a small problem that he had whenever he was around me. It wasn't that big of a problem. I didn't even feel almost anything when we had sex, so I didn't perceive it as cheating. I knew Raf wouldn't take it that way, so I was careful that he never found out. Anyway, he started introducing me to the right people and finally introduced me to Smith Benson. Was it classy or what? This man has two last names. Even his first name is a surname. In any case, I really like Smith. He was an account manager for an entertainment representation firm. They have worked with all sorts of stars and athletes in a variety of fields. I didn't care what kind of field it was, as long as there were no crops growing in it. Smith drove a silver BMW. 
It was the most beautiful car I've ever seen. He hired me as his assistant, and I would no longer have to work as a bank teller. I knew from the very beginning that Smith was interested in me because he was a man. I watched him succeed in trying to get into my pants, and I realized that no matter how rich and powerful he was, or how I thought he was, I had power over him. For the first few weeks, I kept things honest and businesslike, but I also had to be careful because if I made him wait too long, he would replace me with someone who would give him what he wanted. I just wanted something in return. Every day he took me to lunch at a new trendy restaurant. He did my hair and even started buying me clothes and things. I explained to Raph that Smith was simply trying to make sure that my clothing and mannerisms did not attract unwanted attention to me in the company we kept at work. Raph, the jealous little boy that he was, threatened to kick Smith's ass if he laid a finger on me. I think he followed us a couple of times while we were going to lunch, so I had to do something to throw him off the trail. Raph still didn't like the idea of sharing me with someone else, mind you. One of his mysterious clients came to Smith and me. She was an artist from France and had a large number of fans around the world. This was her first time coming to the United States for the show. She planned to be here a month before the show to complete work on her new works. This presented us with an opportunity, I told Smith. What's on your mind, Kathleen? He asked. Where will Amanda stay when she arrives? I asked in response. We have a studio apartment rented for her, he replied. Is there any carpentry work that needs to be done? I asked again. Well, there are a few little things that could be done. Why do you ask? He asked. Because if you hired my husband to do this job, we'd know exactly where he is and when. So we could be together without worrying about him finding us and breaking your ass, I said. So Smith called Raph and invited him to a meeting in two days. They discussed all the details and Smith gave Raph the keys. They shook hands as Raph left. Smith then came to me and told me that I should pay him to hire Raph. I knew exactly what he wanted. Everything had to be perfect. Smith got us a room in a motel on the opposite side of town from the apartment complex where Raph worked. What was Raph doing near the motel? You can teach a puppy not to shit on carpets, but you can't teach a man anything. Raph drove past the motel because the motel was close to the only Burger Queen restaurant in town. When he saw Smith's BMW, he waited outside the motel and saw us leave. Of course, Smith and I didn't know that Raph had seen us. We thought we had managed to get away from him. Smith was pleased, and I was disappointed, but also pleased. I was disappointed because by that time I had already cheated on Rafa with two urban types, and neither of them even knew that they did not satisfy me. Sex with Smith was as boring as sex with Mr. Jones in the bank. At least I could have both. I couldn't believe I saw Katie leaving the motel with that sleazy boss. She was probably too good for me now. She spent so much time with all her city acquaintances that she became too sophisticated for a country boy. Well, if that's what she wants, so be it. I won't interfere with her. I called a friend back home and he told me to call a lawyer about the divorce. So I did. It will be quite expensive, so I will have to keep working. It's like that jockey from the Dukas of Hazard. Why are divorces so expensive? Because they're worth it. The lawyer arranged a meeting with a private investigator to obtain evidence to support my claims. He also told me that since we don't have children and we both work, if I could prove infidelity, I wouldn't have to pay Katie alimony or maintenance. That was what I wanted, just to be free from her. At the same time, I still loved her very much. I just couldn't understand why she did this to me. Yes, I could. Why would I lie to myself? Since first grade, we were both in love with the same person, her. We always did what she wanted. But this time, apparently, she wanted someone else to help her. I drove up to the apartment where I was to work, was hoping there would be a microwave so I could heat up my Burger Queen food. It should have been an easy job, but it would have taken a long time. I needed to build a series of easels and stands in different rooms of the apartment and a few in the backyard. This was necessary so that the person who would live here could paint or do his business wherever he wanted. I also needed to inspect the apartment to see what needed to be fixed. If I could make a repair, I should have done it and build Slugger Smith. If it was beyond my capabilities or comfort zone, I had to let Smith know so he could arrange it before his client arrived. 
As soon as I opened the door, I noticed that it squeaked and stuck when I tried to open it. I added it to the bill and charged Slug Smith 50 bucks for a can of WD-40. In the kitchen, among all the modern appliances, I found a microwave. It was a really good microwave. While my burgers were heating up, I sat down at the breakfast nook table. I started thinking about Katie again. I couldn't bear the thought of staying married to her. She was. No matter how hard I tried, even now I couldn't find anything bad to call her. Looks like I wasn't ready for this. I was distracted by the sound. I wasn't sure I heard him. Maybe it was my imagination. But it sounded like someone had walked up the back stairs very quietly, as if they were only wearing socks. I probably imagined it. I ate my burgers while the smell of charcoal-grilled beef filled the apartment. I measured all the open walls in the rooms where I would put the easels. I had a better idea in a couple of rooms. It made sense to build shelving in front of the walls. After I finished all the measurements inside, I looked outside. I had an idea here, too. I thought I'd build an easel here inside the enclosure so the wind, rain, or dust wouldn't damage any of the paintings or whatever. After that, I cleaned up my mess and went home. Katie was already home. She was wearing one of those slippery night suits she liked to lie in at home. I remember when she looked just as good, if not better, in one of my old shirts or T-shirts. But now she was too sophisticated for that. She walked up to me and I pretended to put my tool belt away when she reached out to hug me. Raph, have you eaten yet, dear? She asked. I wondered why the hell she was asking me this. She doesn't know how to cook and I can't smell the food she brought. What if I was hungry, she would just take my dinner out of her ass. Yeah, I said. I ate the burgers. I was hoping she would remember that I only eat burgers from one place. She knew that even though there was a McClowney's on every corner, I only liked Burger Queen. The only one in town was next to the motel where she spent part of her day. Okay then, she said. Maybe then we can spend some time together. I noticed two things right away. First, her fake city accent was gone, and she spoke like she did when we first arrived here three years ago. This meant that she wanted something. Second, she smelled like she had just taken a shower and freshened up, deleting evidence, as I guessed. She had just had sex with old Slug Smith. Did she really need more sex? Or was it just her way of tricking me into thinking nothing happened? I'm not as sophisticated as Katie and Smith, but that doesn't mean I'm stupid. I could have gone to college, I had a lot of scholarship offers, and my grades were better than Katie's, but when we got here I had to earn money so she could study. She floated towards the bedroom door and simply leaned against the doorframe. I suppose I should have gone after her like crazy, but I just held myself together. I laid out my measurements on the kitchen table and pretended to study them. Honey, I need to make sure all my calculations are correct for this job, I said. If I do something wrong... It will reflect poorly on you in front of your boss. And we don't want that, do we? I asked. I'll come by soon, I said. She frowned, but still went to the bedroom. She's not used to not getting her way. But soon enough, she'll be able to do whatever she wants, because I'll be gone. My heart hurt, but I knew it was the right decision. My dad always told me that when you're in a bad situation... The right decision is usually the one that hurts the most. I couldn't believe that Raph, my Raph, was making me wait for sex. He should have rushed to me at first sight. Ashuli, as soon as he crossed the threshold, he looked at me as if it was the last time. And now he not only wasn't with me everywhere, he made me wait. Smith and every other man I know would do anything to get between my legs, and my Raph made me wait. I lay down on the bed. I wanted him to see my new set. This set was perfect. It was a sky-blue color to highlight my eyes. My breasts were barely held in place at the top and could be released with one tug. My butt, as I said, wasn't anything special, but the right frame makes any picture better. And these panties were the right frame. They were so small that they made my butt look fuller. Smith really liked the way I looked in this set. Unfortunately, the whole thing only took about ten minutes. I thought he was taking a break or changing position, but he was done. He started to fall asleep until he saw me looking at him. Then he just looked at me and asked if I wanted it again. When I said, oh yeah, I can hardly wait, 
He didn't realize I was being sarcastic. Damn. Raf needed to hurry up and get back to me. I started imagining exactly what I wanted my husband to do to me, and I must have fallen asleep because the next thing, I knew it was 3 a.m., and Raf was already lying in bed next to me. What was unusual was that usually, even if I went to bed first, when I woke up in the morning, Raf was always pressed against me from behind. Even if we had one of our rare arguments, this is how we always slept. He said that we reach out to each other at night. But now, not only was he not next to me, he was lying on the other side of the bed and turned away from me. I slowly turned towards him and placed my leg on his leg and thigh, but he did not react. I lightly pushed his shoulder to no avail. Finally, when I woke him up, he yawned and asked what I wanted. Nothing, Raf. Just keep sleeping, I said angrily. I'm not sure, but I thought I saw a smile flicker on his lips as he turned away from me again. This should have been a signal to me that something was wrong in our marriage, in addition to my actions, but I did not notice it. The next morning, when I woke up to get ready for work, Raf had already left. For the first time that I can remember, he didn't kiss me goodbye or say anything before leaving. It was one of those things that I could never wean him off of. He always told me that if he got hurt or died or I died, he wouldn't want to go into another life without telling me he loved me or kissing me one last time. Raf was like a puppy. He wasn't a complex person, so I never thought he had a plan or something was going on. But he never refused or said no to sex with me. I've heard that every man has times when he can't cope, and we're both in our twenties, so maybe he was just tired last night. But why did he sleep away from me? I still needed Raf in my life, and in my own way, I loved him more than anyone in the world. I knew I loved him much more than I felt for Smith. But Smith was my path to the life I wanted, and Raf would never know about him. I left the house as early as possible. I was really worried that Katie would want morning sex. It was strange that I could go from complete admiration to complete disgust in 24 hours, but here I was. What was even weirder was that emotionally, I still loved her very much and wanted us to fix it. But the thought of sex with her, of touching lips with her, made me feel nauseous. So I ended up at the Home Depot near the apartment before sunrise. It opened at 6 a.m., I ordered my materials from the contractor supplies department and went for a coffee while my order was being prepared. I looked at their tools and bought new blades for my jigsaw and circular saw. When I finished, they called me to tell me my order was ready. I obtained receipts for all items to present to Smith for reimbursement and then drove to the site. When I arrived at the apartment, it seemed to me that the light was on on the top floor. I pulled into the driveway and when I looked again, the light was off. I may have made a mistake about which block was lit. In any case, everything was dark now. The person Smith rented the apartment to wasn't due to arrive for a few more weeks, so no one should be here right now. I took out my keys and started unloading my materials. First, I moved everything from my truck into the large living room. Then, using the diagrams and measurements taken the previous day, I divided the load into smaller parts and moved each part to the room for which it was intended. The remaining materials for the outdoor deck were left in the living room. I probably would have done the deck last, and I didn't want my material to get ruined if it rained. After all this unloading and carrying heavy objects, it's time for a break. So I sat down to have some coffee. Perhaps I should have kept moving, because as soon as I sat down, my thoughts went back to Katie. I imagined her doing her best with Smith, which I am too simple and rural to even know. I remembered how, when we first came to California, I had to work for a construction company until I got my license and could barely put food on our table and pay for Katie's school fees. That first year, every time she took another class, we ate tuna or bologna for a week or two so we could buy her textbooks. She was becoming successful and leaving me behind. I didn't regret anything I did or gave up for her. It just hurt so much to know that she betrayed me in such a way. I couldn't help it. Tears started streaming down my cheeks, and I had to bite my lip hard to suppress the urge to just burst into tears. Crying in a situation of extremely strong emotions is still normal, but sitting here and crying is no longer manly. My dad didn't raise weaklings, so I wasn't going to start crying now. 
As I wiped away my tears, I swear I saw movement at the top of the stairs. When I rubbed my eyes, there was no one there. I returned to the truck to get my tool belt and, surprisingly, felt better after the emotional outpouring. The vibration at my side scared me to death, and I almost jumped through the ceiling. It was just my cell phone. I looked at the display and saw that it was Katie, so I didn't answer. I needed to start preparing for a time when she would not be in my life. I didn't allow myself to think about where she was or what she was doing. In the end, I'll still find out everything she did and with whom before the end of the day. The private investigator was supposed to give me daily reports until we had enough evidence for trial. I started putting together a shelving unit in the living room. The way I designed the shelving unit could support canvases and frames of almost any width or height. There were bars every three feet for adjustment so that two or more items of different sizes could be viewed or worked next to each other. For the living room, I thought of doing one shelving unit on the west wall and one opposite on the east wall. If I build them this way, the shelving won't interfere with the entryway or the fireplace. I started cutting the boards to length, then drilled holes for the screws and bolts to assemble them. I decided not to see or drill all the wood at once, because I wanted to see how well the first one would work before committing and possibly wasting all my materials if the design failed. I also started to think it would be nice to have at least one rack ready in case this guy arrived early. Artists are notoriously fickle, so who knows what could have happened. By then, it was almost lunchtime and I knew where I wanted to go. Back to Burger Queen. Damn, these burgers were amazing. So I got into my truck and headed to the ordering machine. Along the way, I noticed Smith's car parking at the motel again. This time I stopped in a fit of anger, but restrained myself. Remembering the lawyer's advice not to do anything stupid. I slowly approached the expensive car, looking around to make sure no one was watching me. I took a sharpened awl out of my tool belt and punctured both rear tires. I then walked forward and deflated both front tires. I knew it was a childish thing to do, but I felt much better. Then, using the same awl, I scratched deeply into the side of the car. I got in my truck and drove away, feeling better. I ordered a regular at Burger Queen and decided I would have to order less from now on. Too many burgers, and I'll have a hard time finding a replacement for Katie when the time comes. While I was there, another thought popped into my head. The damage I did to Smith's car would have affected him in much the same way that having to go out and buy those burgers had affected me. It was a minor inconvenience, but nothing more. This realization cooled my ardor and took the wind out of my sails. I traded the girl I'd loved since first grade for a few scratches and tires. When I returned to the apartment, I was on the verge of tears again. I always felt like there was something wrong with me that she treated me like that. I now realize that they only gave me this job to track my movements during their meetings. This could get very nasty very quickly. There was really nothing I could do to save our marriage. Katie always strived for a better life. She wanted, perhaps even needed, things that I could never give her. The fact that I loved her and loved only her didn't matter. And in Smith, she found someone who could not only provide those things, but was also the person she really wanted. The only thing I could do was get out of the way. I really thought I had experienced the worst of it yesterday, but here it is again, only worse. I'll never get her back. It was like someone just pulled up with a truck full of concrete and then just dumped the entire load on me. I fell to my knees and just sobbed. Every emotion I've ever felt just poured out of me. It was the most desperate sadness I've ever felt. Time lost its meaning. I was absorbed. I had heard people talk about wanting to die when a loved one passes away or dies, and now I know how to feel that. It was as if everything was moving slowly. Every action, every thought required my consent, and I saw no reason for all this. Should I breathe in? Why? Why don't I just stop breathing and get rid of the pain? If I died, maybe she would understand why I just gave in to life and would sympathize. Maybe everything would have started all over again, and she would never have hurt me like that. Maybe she was just a soulless snake who never loved me and never will. She might just laugh at the news of my death because it would save her and Smith the trouble of getting rid of me or divorcing me. My death would be the last gift I would give her. 
It was at that moment that I felt a hand on my shoulder. I'm a pretty big guy, but I have to admit that that little hand totally freaked me out. I jumped almost to the ceiling. My heart was beating so fast that I felt dizzy. When I turned around, I saw a girl. Well, maybe she was a woman. She was just very small. Katie is small compared to me, but this woman was tiny. She was hardly more than five feet tall if she reached that height at all. She had curly brown hair that flowed down her back, stopping at her shoulders and flowing forward. But it wasn't her hair that stopped me in my tracks. It was the expression on her face. I have never seen so much concern in one face. Her eyes were hard to describe. They were light gray-green, piercing and attractive at the same time. They seemed to absorb every detail of everything they looked at. The gaze of those eyes did not form opinions. There was no right or wrong. It only measured and compared details. It seemed that after she saw someone in this way, she could easily reproduce any and all objects she saw. And at that moment, she saw me. As my brain reconnected with my mouth and I realized I could speak, words began to come out. Hey, who the hell are you and why are you here? I barked. You're so sad, she said, in the thickest accent I've ever heard. This is my home, she said. You make my, as you say, picture stands. Am I the only one who thinks you make them better than these, as they call them? I was speechless and words just wouldn't come. I was on the second floor and I smelled food again, she said, smiling. I wanted so badly to just come down and eat with you, but no one must know that I'm here. I work day and night, but I have no ideas, only pictures without a vision. I could do the same with a camera. It's not art. And as I watched you become consumed by this sadness, it threatens to take you away. You should tell me about it. Maybe I can help. Come on, we'll sit down and talk about it. She led me to the same table where I had been sitting for several days. All those times when I thought I heard something, apparently I actually heard something. She was again very small and obviously French. She was the person to whom Smith rented the apartment. So I guess that technically made her my employer. Or in fact, she was my boss's boss. She was nothing like that bastard Smith. She seemed really nice. She was caring and attentive. These are not the words I would use to describe Smith. Although you could, because he cared about seducing my wife and cared enough about keeping me occupied so that I wouldn't bust his ass when I found out about it. She opened the package and looked inside. Her little face lit up. Oh, great, she said. You've got enough for two. She busied herself arranging the plates and cutlery, ran upstairs and returned with a bottle of wine. Quickly, the meal went from fast food to luxury dining. It wouldn't surprise me if she brought out the candles and the violinist. Amanda Anderson, she introduced herself in an accent that I was beginning to like. It doesn't sound much like a French name, I said. And you? She smiled. Rough Jenkins, I replied, shaking her small, outstretched hand. We then sat down and ate my burgers from Burger Queen. We talked about a lot of things for the next hour. We talked about her paintings. We talked about how she liked my shelving system for both displaying her completed pieces and painting those in progress. She asked me to keep the fact of her early arrival a secret. She wasn't due to arrive for almost another month. I promised her that I wouldn't tell anyone. As time went on, it became obvious that we were getting along well. We both had our own sorrows that we had not yet decided to tell each other about. I realized that her sadness was related to her work. I didn't know much about art or painting, but I was sure she was good at it. I have to admit that I probably wouldn't be able to tell a good picture from a bad one. By the time I noticed the time, my cell phone was ringing and I noticed it was time to leave. I didn't know how time passed so quickly, but I felt better than I had in the last few days. Amanda was not Katie, but she was a woman and a beautiful one at that. If she didn't think I was worthless, maybe there was life after Katie. By the time I got home, I expected Raph to already be there. I managed to take a shower at the motel. Let's admit what kind of woman, especially one who needs sex, would prefer it with a bald man over 50, like Smith, when she has a strong husband like my Raph. A big part of it also had to do with Smith just using me. It was as if he was paying for it, and it was his right. With Raph, I was the one in control. 
If I wanted him to do something or buy me something, or if I wanted him to stop doing something, I simply limited access to myself until I got my way. With Smith, he would just look at his watch and say, let's go. There was no debate. We didn't even have good dinners anymore. Treating me well was obviously just a way to get in my pants. Now that he did it, I was just his office mistress and that was it. He no longer introduced me to people, did not try to teach me anything. I didn't even go to meetings with him anymore. And the sex was the same as the first few times. He may have been a high-class gentleman in society, but in the bedroom, he was a true Neanderthal. These last few days have made me want Raph like never before. There were so many things I took for granted about him. I couldn't wait for him to come home so I could erase those bad memories. I decided to call him to hurry him up. I pressed button number one on my cell phone, and it called him. His phone kept ringing and then went to voicemail. He must have been very busy not picking up my call. I got up and decided to try to cook something. It would be an adventure because I really didn't know how to cook. I looked in the refrigerator and saw a plate with several marinated steaks. This should be pretty simple. I'll just put them in the oven under the broiler and heat up some vegetables in the microwave. I turned on the TV and found a cooking show. It was perfect. Even though the old fat woman on the show cooked the chicken, she also baked it like me. She baked potatoes with chicken. I could do the same. Then I just make a little salad and voila, dinner. Raph will be so proud of me. I couldn't believe I was doing this. My face actually turned red from the heat of the oven. I felt like some kind of pioneer. About an hour later, Raph arrived. He somehow half smiled at me and went into the bedroom. He walked with a slight limp, and it was difficult for me to understand his facial expression. I had known this man his whole life, and he wasn't that complicated. There was something bothering him. When he looked at me, no matter what we were going through, I always saw love on his face. When my dad told him he was disappointed that I chose some ex-athlete carpenter to spend my life with and I didn't say anything to protect him, Raf looked a little sad, but I could still see the love in his eyes. It was always there, even in the worst conditions. But now, when I looked at him, I saw only pain and sadness. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I knew something was wrong. Raf, dear, are you hungry? I asked. I made us dinner, I said proudly. Smells good, he replied quickly. I fell down the stairs and hurt my back. I had to go to the emergency room. They gave me some pain pills. They made me so sleepy that I could barely drive home. I'm going to go to sleep, he said. He then disappeared into the bedroom and closed the door. I turned off the oven and didn't know what to do with the food, so I just left it on the counter. Raph will deal with her later or tomorrow. We've had sex in worse conditions, so I'll just wait until his pain subsides, then he'll want me. I walked into the darkened bedroom and crawled under the covers. I was already starting to get excited in anticipation. I turned to Raph to kiss him and found myself looking not at his face but at his legs. I shook him and he screamed. Raph, what happened? I asked. Any movement hurts my back, he replied. Why are you lying like that? I asked. I use pillows to elevate my legs above my head to stimulate blood flow, he said. Do you want me on top? I asked. I'm tired, he yawned. The painkillers knocked me out. I just lay there for a while. Part of me was so upset that I thought about going out and satisfying myself. The other part felt like something was wrong. Finally, when I was almost asleep, I said, Good night, Raph. I love you. The next thing I know, I suddenly woke up. For most of my life, Raf always told me he loved me. He was the first of us to say it. And on the rare occasions when I said it first, and believe me, these were few and far between, he always responded within microseconds. This time he simply mumbled something that was almost unintelligible. Although my conscious mind couldn't really make out the words, my subconscious mind caught them and was wide open. Raf's grunt sounded a lot like, Tell it to Smith! Suddenly my mind went into full gear. There were two possibilities here. One was that Raf was becoming increasingly jealous of the time I was spending with Smith, and he was avoiding me, sulking like the brat he always was. The second and worst-case scenario 
was that Raff knew about me and Smith. I couldn't sleep. My mind just kept going through all the facts I had. I rolled over and moved my head towards his side. I tried to press myself against him as carefully as possible, and as soon as my hand touched him, he jerked away from me. I dozed off for a second, and when I woke up he was gone. He couldn't leave for work. It was only three o'clock in the morning. I finally found him stretched out on the living room couch. I went back to bed, but set the alarm to wake me up early in the morning. I woke up at 6 a.m. and found that he was already gone. I still didn't know if he knew or not, but he was definitely avoiding me, and it wasn't nice. I went back to sleep and woke up at my usual time to get to work by 9 a.m. When Smith arrived at 10, I brought him his morning latte and scones and waited to talk to him. Smith drank his coffee and looked through the financial pages. I should have just waited for him to finish. This was another one of those things I didn't like about him. His needs were so much more important than anyone else's. Is this how I felt about Raph? I never realized before how much he must love me to put up with this. Is there something we need to talk about, my dear? He said. I think Raph knows about us, I said quickly. Okay, he said. This should help speed up the process. What? I said. Yes, that means you can divorce him when the time comes and be with me. We are similar in many ways, he said. We both appreciate the finer things in life. We are both motivated to succeed. We are compatible in everything. We belong together, he said. You have outgrown this village carpenter. He simply cannot offer you what I can. He is not my equal in anything, he continued. I was shocked, so I started nodding my head as if I agreed with him as I walked back to my desk. I needed to think about it. What Smith said would have made my father happy, and until yesterday, it would have made me very happy. My father always thought Raph was inferior to me, but Raph never showed me anything but love. He constantly sacrificed to be with me. Smith kept me close as a convenience. I was Raph's whole life. His world revolved around me. Smith's world was centered on himself, and he sometimes took the time to have sex with me. Raph never stopped curling my toes. He made pleasure a priority for me whenever we had sex. And until a few days ago, our sex life was everything I wanted. Smith was never able to satisfy me. Raph constantly told me how much he loved me. He was ready to do anything for me. Smith never even said that he liked me or that I was beautiful. Even this morning, all he said was that we belong together, as if it was a merger of companies to provide better income for both. I got out of my truck, dragging two bags behind me. I walked up to the door of the dark apartment and tried to hold the bags and keys at the same time. I turned on the light and put the bags on the table. I knocked on the door leading to the upper yet hidden level of the apartment. Almost instantly, it opened, as if it had been waiting for me. I wasn't sure you'd come back, she said. I wasn't sure you'd open the door again, or if you'd even still be here, I replied. I have to trust you, she said, stepping into the kitchen. What do you have here? She asked. Honestly, I don't know what you usually eat for breakfast or what you ate while you were hiding here, but I brought you this, I said, pointing to one of the bags. She opened the package and smiled. I brought her a double mocha latte and a croissant with a choice of toppings she could add. She almost doubled in laughter and looked into another package. She looked at my McClony breakfast in disbelief, as if it might jump off the plate and bite her. She also smiled when she smelled my strong black coffee. The McClowney breakfast is an all-American invention. It consists of one of those synthetic egg patties, four strips of bacon, American cheese, and a sausage patty, all sandwiched between the halves of an English muffin. Most people get fat just by looking at one of these. Eating one was like having your arteries completely clogged with fat. McClowney's breakfast is why America is so fat. There's nothing like McClowney's breakfast at Burger Queen. She shook her head at the decadent sandwich. Then she ran around the kitchen, turning on the lights and arranging the plates, just as she had done the night before. For some reason, she took out knives and forks and two cups. She then ran upstairs again and came down with a small bottle of orange juice. She took glasses out of the cabinet while I sat there in amazement. Watching her run again and again, I looked at her carefully. Seeing her in the bright light made me realize several things. 
One of them was that she was a truly beautiful woman. Not in the sense of California or Vegas blondes with silicone. She was just a truly beautiful woman. She was the type of woman who, as she grows older and gets wrinkles on her face, doesn't have to worry about it because all these supposed flaws will add to her character. Instead of running to the nearest plastic surgeon for Botox, wrinkles and imperfections will add to her beauty. From her curly hair to her wide-set eyes and upturned nose, especially her lips and mouth, she was a true beauty. I could spend hours describing her smile, the mischievous way that one side went up and the other slightly down at the same time, or the way she pursed her lips to express joy and bewilderment within moments of each other. Despite her small stature, she was very proportionate. Her proportions created the illusion of size where there was none. Her breasts, measured by volume, were nowhere close to Katie's, but appeared larger on her small frame. I've always heard about the incredible legs of French women and the reasons why. They say it's because they walk instead of drive, or because they climb the stairs of the Eiffel Tower, but I've never seen legs like these anywhere else. And at the top where they met was the most perfect butt I had ever seen. Next to this woman, my Katie would look as big and clumsy as a cow, and it's unlikely that it would even be comparable. Again, I marveled at how she turned the items I brought into a feast rather than just food and seemed to enjoy it. When we sat down opposite each other, she quickly lowered her head for a few seconds and then raised it, smiled, and began to eat with appetite. I looked at my plate. She ruined my breakfast from McClony. She cut it in half and divided the ingredients into two breakfasts. We both had a couple of pieces of bacon, half a patty, an egg scone, half an English muffin, which she spread with jam. We also had a small glass of juice and a cup of my strong black coffee. I hate this sweet fake coffee you brought, she said. It tastes like crap. Why are you drinking it? I don't drink it, I said. But people here think that's how they drink it in Europe. I need strong black coffee when I work, she said, taking a bite of bacon. She reached for one of my pieces of bacon, and my hand reached out to stop her. When our hands touched, an electric sensation passed through me from the contact. She smiled again, and then playfully took my bacon. We'll split it, she said with mischief in her eyes. Wait, I asked. Why are we sharing my bacon? Because, Raph Jenkins, I already ate mine, she smiled. I've never heard my name sound so sexy. When she said Ruff Jenkins, I understood why my mother gave me that name. The only woman I've ever been with in my life was Katie, and she never affected me like that. The thought of Katie lowered my mood again, and Amanda noticed it. What are you going to do while I'm working today, Ruff Jenkins? She asked. I'm going to put a frame on the porch so you can work inside without me disturbing you, I said. Why don't you work on the shelving you started in the main room? That way we can talk while we work, she said. That would be good, I said, surprised. I always imagined that artists would be moody and aloof, like that scoundrel Smith. Amanda seemed so level-headed and down-to-earth that it was hard to imagine her as a famous artist. I went out to my truck and brought my tool belt and toolbox. I brought the necessary things into the living room. As I began to work, I noticed that Amanda had already taken out a canvas from somewhere and was quickly adding shapes to the empty canvas with a small brush. It was mesmerizing and I thought I could look at her forever. She seemed to alternate very precise and neat strokes with wild and disorderly ones. Again, this was not the behavior or style I would expect from a famous artist. I was afraid to turn on my saw, thinking the noise might distract or scare her. When I saw her sit down in front of her canvas and look at it, I raised my hand and pointed at the saw. She smiled and nodded that this was normal. She came over and watched me line up the pieces and then saw them. We started talking and she told me why she came earlier. It turned out that she didn't like the work she did for the exhibition. They were simply repetitions of what she had, already done. She didn't find them inspiring and felt like she was just selling herself. Buyers and collectors would of course be pleased because she painted many Amanda Anderson-like paintings, but she felt she had to forge a new path and continue to explore her art, so she arrived early to revisit her new work and try something different, 
hoping the change of location, culture, and environment would get her creative juices flowing. I, in turn, told her about my fictitious marriage. I left out the names, not sure how she would react to learning that her agent was sleeping with my wife. She was very sympathetic. It was really cathartic for me to talk it out. I didn't tell anyone about my situation except the lawyer and the private detective. When noon arrived, we went to have lunch. We found a cute little restaurant by the river. Oddly enough, despite its quality, I would be hard-pressed to eat at Burger Queen again. Amanda, as expected, was great company. She made me laugh and pointed out several differences between life in our country and hers. This continued for the next few weeks as I spent my days in the apartment with Amanda, turning it into the perfect studio for an artist. At night, I would get home just in time to crawl into bed and then be up before Katie woke up and out again at first light. The few times we did run into each other were hellish. Katie argued that we needed to talk, and I argued that I was too busy or too tired. Finally, two weeks before Amanda's exhibition, she officially arrived in town. She told Smith after the inspection that she really liked the apartment and the shelving system, as well as the outdoor shelters for her work. She also asked that the foreman in charge of the work be present because she had changes and ideas that she wanted him to implement. Smith told her he would take care of it. I was excited about this because it meant that I would spend more time with Amanda and that we could go places without worrying about anyone recognizing her. Little did I know that my bubble of happiness was about to burst. I received a call from Smith asking me to meet him at his office. I already knew what it would be about. He was going to ask me to do the job Amanda requested. What I didn't expect was that when I arrived early, I found Smith with his hand up Katie's dress. Even though I had DVDs and pictures of them together, seeing it in person was different. I really thought all my emotions about their relationship were under control. However, it was as if someone had ripped my stomach out through my throat. There was an expression of lust on Smith's face that was hard to describe in words. Katie looked like she was just putting up with it. When Smith finally noticed me standing there, he pulled his arm out so quickly I thought he was going to break his elbow, and Katie immediately started saying the classic phrase, Raph, it's not what you think. Come on, cat, I said. Come on, old man, there's no need to be corny about it, Smith said. That wasn't the right thing to do because at that moment, I crossed the room and punched Smith in the face. There was a sickening crack, almost a click, as my fist made contact with his nose. He fell across the table and ended up in a pile behind it. I started to walk around the table to get to him, but stopped. None of them were worth it. I told you, if you touch her, I'll smash your ass, I shouted at Smith. She's yours now. He curled up at the table, holding his nose and crying. Raph, wait, Katie shouted as she followed me out of the office. We can fix this. It doesn't mean anything. I got in my truck and just drove away. I spent the next hour just driving around aimlessly. I needed to collect my thoughts, but I couldn't. I decided to do what the guys on TV always do in situations like this. You know, go home, pack as many of your things as possible, and check into a motel. It didn't work. As soon as I pulled up, this bitch started walking towards me. I put the car in reverse and pulled back onto the road as she ran after me, screaming. I decided that the best thing to do would be to just do something that I still enjoy. I needed an activity that would allow me to think while I was doing it. I also didn't want to check into a hotel right away, because with all of Smith's money it wouldn't be hard for him to track me. So I planned to check into the motel just before bed and check out as soon as I woke up. If I use different locations every night, it will be difficult for them to track me. Now that I knew and they knew that I knew, I needed to file for divorce first, so I called my lawyer and told him to make sure the papers were ready. Then I went to Amanda's apartment to do some work. When she opened the door and smiled, it was like the sun after a long, long, rainy night. Her contagious good humor almost took me away from it all. I was wondering when you would arrive, she said cheerfully. You're late. Come and see what we have for breakfast, she said. That's what struck me about Amanda. Perhaps this is a European or even French trait. She was the personification of comfort. Eat, drink, and be merry, without stress. Your problems will resolve themselves. 
She had a breakfast that looked like it was prepared for a king. There were all kinds of muffins, cookies, coffee, teas and juices, butters of different flavors, jams and jellies, cold cuts, bacon, sausages, and ham. There were bowls with different types of fruits and melons. It was strange. If this is what she's used to, she must still be laughing about sharing my burgers from Burger Queen with me. What is all this for? I asked. This is all for us. She smiled. I called the agency and told them that I needed breakfast for two. Let's go, we'll eat, and then you'll tell me what's making you so angry. No, I said. I don't want to talk about it. I just want to forget. Okay, she said, pursing her lips in the little grimace she sometimes made. Then we'll just eat. As she said it, she nodded her head as if she had just settled a big argument. It was sweet. With just five days until the exhibition, Amanda had a lot of work to do to get her new pieces ready. She also had several sketches she was doing that may or may not have made it into the exhibition. She still hasn't decided whether the exhibition will have a theme. Sometimes she didn't have a theme. She would simply show her latest work and offer it for sale through a gallery or broker. Her last show made over $600,000. The agency took 30%, and after all the fees she received about $290,000 after taxes. Her goal was to make a couple million dollars and then retire. Part of the problem was that she simply couldn't resist traveling and shopping. It was as if she was looking for something but didn't know what exactly. So after breakfast, Amanda made me promise to finish the shelving in the smaller room upstairs that she used for work. She wanted to use the main room, as she called the living room, for an impromptu pre-show show for gallery owners and art critics. Amanda would be working in the main room, putting the finishing touches on her completed or nearly completed pieces, while I would create spaces to display the pieces she was currently working on. I grabbed my tool belt from the truck and walked up the stairs. The first room I looked into wasn't a studio. It was her bedroom. I didn't know what to expect, but this definitely wasn't it. Kathy always kept everything neatly organized, making sure I maintained order. Her makeup and clothes were neatly laid out and organized by item and color so she could easily put together outfits. Amanda's bedroom, by comparison, was chaotic. It looked more like a teenager's room. Things were scattered everywhere. On the table, there was a computer with a graphics program turned on. On the bed lay a laptop with another graphics program, forgotten. The radio was playing and there were clothes, socks, shoes, panties, bras, notepads, and random sheets and scraps of paper everywhere. I wondered how she even found anything in this mess. But then I understood. This mess was like her. It hinted at all kinds of possibilities. He said that if you look, you can find anything, but you have to put in the effort and look. He said you shouldn't rely on things being exactly the way you want them to be. He said that there is no need to make plans, just live. I closed the door and smiled for the first time that day and went in search of a studio. I found her a few minutes later and regretted it because surprise, shock, and pain fought for supremacy in my mind. This powerful mixture of emotions boiled like soup in a cauldron and exploded out of me in the form of rage. For the second time that day, I lost control. Amanda sometimes worked in watercolors, and there were large cans of different colors of paint that she used to mix her paints. I grabbed a full can of paint and threw it across the room where it exploded on a large canvas, splattering paint across several paintings by that smug, sarcastic bastard Smith. Without thinking, I screamed in rage and knocked over another can of paint on Smith and one on my unfaithful wife's paintings. By this time, Amanda came running upstairs to see what was happening. There was a man with her. He was terrified. Amanda took one look at what I had done and intervened forcefully. She walked into the room and handed me another can of paint, then pointed to the still untouched painting of Smith and Kathy together. Then she nodded and stepped back. I opened the can and this time more deliberately poured paint on the canvas. Then Amanda started passing me smaller cans of paint and I just threw them randomly towards the paintings until I got tired. I fell to my knees, completely exhausted. Amanda sat next to me, massaging my head and shoulders. This is what you're so sad about, isn't it? I nodded, unable to look at her. At this time, 
The little man recovered from the shock and began screaming at me. Do you understand what you've done? He shouted. Each one of these paintings was probably worth $20,000. You'll be paying them off for the rest of your life. He shouted. Oh, and you can't get away with it? The security system recorded video of you doing this. Wait, when I sue you in court. You may not even have to start making payments until you get out of prison. The man was furious. Why are you so angry? Amanda asked calmly. These are my paintings, not yours, she said. There will be no trial, no charges, and no payments. And if all you care about is your commission, perhaps we can work out a deal so you don't have to worry about getting paid for any of my work in the future, she continued. You may not have noticed that I ended up helping him throw the paint. But I just... The little man began. You're just leaving, Amanda finished. This part of my history, as my dad always said, is where the rubber meets the road. When Raph caught Smith's hand under my dress, I felt like my life was over. Smith had been taking advantage of me more and more lately, but it was always the same. Comparisons between him and Raph were not only inevitable, but also obvious. Smith just had sex with me, and not even very well. To Smith, I was something he could use as he wanted, because he paid for me. No, he didn't pay me for sex. But he gave me things and hinted at a life outside of work. The life I've always dreamed of. He never told me he liked me, much less loved me. Looking back, I realized that he did not love me. He spent time and effort on me, because, like his car, or his watch, or any of his things, I was the best he could afford at the time. I reminded him of one of those things you see on the internet. Then I realized that after all our lives, after all this time, I really loved Raph much more than I wanted to admit. I just took him for granted because he was always there for me in every need. I missed his puppy dog eyes every time he looked at me, the way he was willing to do literally anything I asked for. I missed the way he put me first, even despite his own needs. I remember waking up late one morning when I had an interview, and I called Raph and told him that my clothes weren't ready. He came home from work, made me breakfast, and ironed my clothes while I showered and put on makeup. Smith would never do that for me. I didn't even know where Smith lived. How could I be so stupid? My dad apparently raised one stupid child. I've been trying to talk to Raph all week. He didn't talk to me at all. He knows I need a lot of sleep. He should know this because he took care of me for so many years. He was always there long after I fell asleep and gone long before I woke up. He didn't even sleep in the same bed with me. I can't believe it's been so long since we made love. I was even more sure now that Raph not only knew about Smith and me, but also lost me to Smith. From the way he looked at me now, he tried to hide it. But his puppy dog eyes and expressions of endless love were gone. Sometimes... Looking at me from afar, I saw only contempt in his eyes. Raph was always one of those kind-hearted good old men. He didn't talk bad about anyone. Now he always had a much harsher expression on his face, a cynicism that was not there before. I knew it was my fault. I had a good thing and ruined it. I still remember Smith flying over the table and just lying there and crying. I remember stalking Raph, trying to get him to talk to me so I could tell him how I felt. I needed to tell him that I was wrong and that we could fix it. I would have done everything he wanted. I would have lived the way he wanted. But it was too late, and he left. Did Ralph really say the words, She's all yours? I returned to the room to get the keys and found Smith still lying there and whining. He left? He asked with clear fear on his face. Smith looked like he was in pain to talk. His nose was very swollen, obviously broken. I helped him to his feet and told him to call his doctor. I took him to the doctor's office and waited while he was examined. I sat there while Smith lied to his doctor. He told his doctor that he entered a door that he thought was unlocked, but it was not. When the doctor looked at Smith, he looked like he didn't believe him. Smith then came up with lie number two. He told the doctor that he had started boxing. The doctor told Smith that at his age, he should have chosen a different sport. He gave Smith an injection to numb the aria and inserted his nose. This involved a lot of screaming, 
which I didn't think was enough for the pain Smith had caused Raff and me. He gave me a prescription for more pain medication for Smith, and I drove him back to the office. Under the circumstances, it seemed odd that Smith wouldn't let me take him home, but I didn't have time to think about it. I knew Raff would come home eventually, and I needed to be there when he did. I'm lucky I got there before him. I could tell because everything, including all of Raff's things, was still there. I walked around the floors thinking what exactly to tell him. I expected him to do exactly what I wanted him to do for years, to get him to listen to me. I was willing to give him anything he wanted just to forgive me. Thank God for Ford trucks I heard him coming long before he pulled up in our driveway. I ran out to meet him, which was probably a mistake. Rafe looked up, saw me, and immediately backed out of the driveway. He didn't even slow down when I chased him down the road. I went back into the house and just started crying. It wasn't my style. As I already said, my father raised me to do great things. I was a purposeful person and not a pathetic little mouse. But this time, thinking about everything I've done in my entire life, I didn't see anything great that it would give me. If Rafe and I had saved money and been careful, he could have had a successful contracting business and I could have been successful in business. We might have been rich or at least well off, but at the end of the day, the most important thing we had was each other. When old people, rich or poor, look back on their lives, what they most often talk about is not the things they had or the things they bought. They talk about the things they did and the people they did them with. In trying to seize the life I wanted, I almost lost the person my life with would mean the most to me. The people Smith introduced me to, rich and important people, didn't really accept me as one of them, as an equal. They accepted me as an employee of Smith. I don't think any of these men or women would recognize me again if they ran into me. Maybe men would recognize my breasts. They would spend enough time talking to them and looking at them. So why do I need them? I don't need them. I needed to talk to Rafe to start rebuilding our lives. I looked at the clock. More than two hours had passed. And I couldn't believe I spent so much time crying. I needed to come up with a plan to get my man back. My cell phone started ringing. I picked it up, looking in the mirror. I looked terrible. My makeup ran all over my face, giving me the appearance of a clown. If anyone saw me like this, they would wonder what happened to me. I had to be beautiful. If they saw me like this, they would joke about it forever. The face that started a thousand jokes. Hello? I said, in a voice that radiated strength and determination that I didn't feel. Kathleen, where are you? I'm home. Where else could I be? I answered. It was, of course, Smith. We have a problem. Something happened to Amanda, he said. I'll be right there, I said into the phone. This gave me the chance I needed to get away from Smith. I wanted to make it personal. I wanted to be professional about it. I also wanted to take any emotional involvement out of it. I assumed he would want the same, so that all this remains secret. After all, he had a reputation to take care of, as well as the fact that having an affair with a married subordinate couldn't be good for his career. When I arrived at the office, it was all I could do not to laugh. If I thought I looked like a clown, with makeup smeared all over my face, at least I could wash my face and reapply my makeup. Smith looked much worse. His nose was so swollen, it looked like he had a balloon stuck in his face. His cheeks were also swollen, and his whole face was red. Hoping to maintain a professional decorum, I restrained my urge to laugh. What happened to Miss Anderson? I asked. Her personal manager called me and said something about some bully who destroyed some of her things, Smith said. I called her before I called you, and she said everything was working out to her satisfaction, and everything was fine he said. If everything is fine, why the hell did you make me come here? I exclaimed. My marriage is on the verge of divorce. That's why you should be here, he said. If you want him back, although I can't imagine why you would, here's what you need to do, he told me. You need to threaten him with divorce, really scare him to death and make him crawl back to you. If you show force, fool him into thinking that we will be together, he will come back, running with his tail between his legs. Then you can dictate the terms of your mariax, not the other way around, he said. In my weakened emotional state, his words seemed reasonable to me. 
I didn't even notice that he said, fool him into thinking we'll be together. Above all, we need to keep this a secret until the end of the show, he said. If the show goes well, I'll move up the ranks and you'll be with me, he continued. But I shouldn't hire a lawyer, I asked weakly. No way, he said, as if in shock. His reaction to this question in itself should have raised alarm bells, but it did not. We need to keep this a secret, he said. And don't worry, he can't do anything, he has no proof of anything. He only has what he saw or thinks he saw, and if he presses any charges, I'll just accuse him of assault and use you as witness to force him to give up the divorce, he said confidently. Then, after the show, when that little French girl leaves the country, the three of us will sit down and discuss it calmly. I'm sure we can come to an agreement somehow, he said. After I had time to calm down, I realized what my anger was leading to. We sat on sun loungers on the deck, facing each other. Amanda, amazingly, gently massaged my temples with her fingers. It felt wonderful, and I didn't want her to ever stop. Amanda, I'm so sorry, I said. Shh, she replied. If it takes forever, I'll pay you back, I said. Tss. Any condition you can think of, I said seriously. Amanda looked into my eyes at that moment. I swear I thought she was going to kiss me. Then there was a soft knock on the door, followed by a very feminine voice. Oh, there you are, honey. I was looking for you, he said. Standing in the doorway, looking at us and smiling, was the biggest man I've ever seen. And he was probably gay. He walked towards us, and Amanda stood up and hugged him tightly. How jealous I was. Victor Wang, meet Rafe Jenkins, she said happily. Now I understand why you were hiding, Victor said. When he spoke, he looked at me and I had a desire to dress warmly, although I was fully dressed. What do you want to show me? He asked. Show me something new and exciting, shiny. Amanda and Victor went into the living room and looked at her work. I followed them, watching, feeling that Amanda and I still had a lot to talk about. He silently moved from one picture to another, examining them from top to bottom. He seemed to give each no more than a cursory glance. Hmm, he said, looking quickly at the landscape. Yeah, he said, looking at what I thought was a beautiful picture of two small children. Well, he said, you drew them. There was a mocking expression on his face. That in itself told me he didn't like it. What do you think? Amanda asked. Well, honey, like I said, you drew them. That in itself will get you a lot of money from rich idiots who think they can have art. But, said Amanda, but between you and me, dear, just looking at them bores me and not in a good way. He was silent for a moment, and then spoke again. It's like when aging rock stars can't come up with anything new and release a greatest hits album, sometimes even when they haven't had any hits. It's like trying to make money before they go off and become music teachers, he added. Do you have anything else? He asked in a dubious tone. Something new and original? Well, I was working on a series of character studies, but they were irreparably damaged and probably won't be restored, Amanda said quietly. Any chance you could just redraw them, he asked. Well, if you look at them, I'll think about it. But no, I think the topic is too sensitive on a personal level, she said. If I hadn't realized that I had fallen in love with Amanda before, it was obvious now. This guy was some art critic who, although he was supposed to be her friend, told her almost the same thing he told me. He thought her work imported from France, was terrible. Oh yes, they were good paintings and they would have sold for thousands of dollars, but they would have done nothing to enhance her reputation as an artist. Even knowing this, she almost refused to redraw the work above for fear of hurting me. And even as she said this, her gaze crossed mine. If you like them, if you think they're good, she'll redraw them, I said quietly. Well, honey, let's see, he said loudly. As he passed us with his massive figure, he looked at both of us in turn and then raised his hands between us as if he was cutting something or doing a karate chop. Amanda and I looked at each other. We were both confused. She shrugged in the universal, I don't know what that meant gesture. We followed his massive figure up with Amanda leading the way to the studio as we reached the top. 
Victor entered the room and slowly surveyed the destruction left behind by my rampage. He walked slowly around the room, stopping and fixing his gaze on certain objects. Then he stepped back, almost pushing us out of the room. He shook his head no and looked at me. I looked sheepishly at my feet, shoving my hands deep into my pockets. Why didn't you show me this first? He asked excitedly. Amanda, you have to find a way to accurately reproduce this room, he said enthusiastically. Rage, raw emotion, angst, just pain, he practically screamed. The only pain I understood was the headache his voice gave me. This is what you need, girl, this is it. Obviously you did something for this, he said, pointing at me. You don't hit her, do you? He asked. Of course not, I replied sharply. Why did you even think that? Amanda asked. Well, honey, there's such tension between you two. You can feel it, he said. So I thought maybe you two had a fight and this was the result. Be sure to do your next set of paintings after makeup sex. Can I bring the camera crew here to start taking photos for my article? Or will you give me exclusive access before the show? He asked excitedly. Uh, before the show, Amanda said. We have things to discuss and decide. Victor waved to us and headed for the door, muttering loudly as he left. Amanda just stared at me as I stood there like a deer caught in headlights. I didn't understand anything about what was happening and hoped that she would explain it to me. But as always, Amanda just looked at me and then very carefully walked back into the room and looked around. Every detail of the room was subjected to her careful gaze. She then ran out, ordering me not to move. She ran into the jungle she called her bedroom. Then I heard things flying around the room as her voice shouted excitedly in a mixture of English and French. She appeared moments later with a very modern camera. Maybe she wasn't that great, but what do I know about cameras? She stopped right in front of me, stood on her tiptoes, and kissed me. She kissed me right on the lips. I was shocked. Besides my mother, Amanda was the second woman to ever kiss me. It was only a short kiss but it said a lot about what could follow. The events of the last moments made me forget about all my problems and pain. I watched as she first photographed the entire room from almost every possible angle. She then went back and photographed each painting from every possible angle. She made gentle sounds as she worked. Then she put down the camera and began measuring the size of the room, the location of the windows, and even took out a device that measured the intensity and direction of light in the room. She raised one small but determined finger to hold me in place so I wouldn't move. She took out her mobile phone and dialed several numbers. Once the connection was established, she began speaking in rapid French to someone on the other end, then waited. When she started speaking again, it was in English. No, I can't talk to him about it and it has to be done immediately, she said. I'll send you photos in the next few moments. I'll also send the measurements. The room should be reproduced exactly as it is, she said. We will have two rooms. The front entrance will be a regular gallery and will show my new French collection. Then there will be a special room. It contains my new works, she continued. Admission to the main room will be at the regular price, but there will be an additional fee to enter the second room. We will discuss all the details tomorrow. We will also need to change the contracts. Well, our agreement was only to show the paintings that I brought with me from France so it seems that the new paintings require negotiations. But if you do not agree, we can hold a show with only French works, as was previously agreed, and I can organize another exhibition of my work with another agency, she said in a decisive tone. I'm used to Amanda the woman and Amanda the artist, but Amanda the businesswoman was a completely different person. I have found that some of your staff, how to put it in English, are not meeting expectations she said. Yes, yes, we will meet tomorrow, she said sharply, and then hung up and went into the bedroom. There she fed her measurement sheets into the scanner and sent them somewhere. This was followed by uploading pictures from the camera's memory card somewhere to the internet. Rafe Jenkins, where are we going to have dinner tonight? She asked me. Her smile was very different from the one I was used to. It showed a lot more teeth, but the overall expression wasn't happiness. It was victory, conquest, and a hundred other subtler emotions rolled into one face. It was like a hungry wolf looking at a hunted rabbit. When she turned to me, the smile turned back into the expression I was used to. 
That smile had fewer teeth, and there was sadness in her eyes again. Or maybe it was pity for me. I know you're not feeling very well right now, she said. I'll do everything I can to make you feel better. But we have a lot of things to discuss right now. And as you know, I like to talk over food. So where are we going to have dinner? She asked with a smile. Texas Roadhouse, I laughed. Rafe didn't come home all night. Although I listened to Smith's ideas on how to handle it, I had my doubts. My idea was to try to talk to Rafe anyway, using Smith's plan as a last chance. What Smith didn't know was that Rafe had two things on his side. He has successfully used these two things even since his high school football days. The first is luck. Maybe because Rafe was a good guy at heart, so luck just always followed him. Even when it seemed like he had screwed everything up, things always somehow worked out for him and usually for me as well but this time it seemed like we were on different sides, so I couldn't count on that luck to help me. Rafe's second advantage was that he was damn unpredictable. Even on the football field, defenders had a hard time tracking him because he never seemed to be running where they thought he was going or doing what they expected him to do. Smith should have known that after yesterday. I'm sure somehow Rafe will come out of this smelling like roses and I'll be in the worst possible situation so I waited for him to make sure he didn't do his little trick like keeping quiet after I fell asleep. I spread a blanket and pillows in the doorway and slept there. This way he won't even be able to open the door without waking me up. I still tossed and turned all night. I woke up at the slightest rustle, looking for him. Finally, at three o'clock in the morning, I realized that my husband was not coming home. I also realized that I had pushed him away from me, for the first time in a very long time, tears rolled down my cheeks and I couldn't stop crying. I no longer wanted to be a strong and resilient woman. I just wanted my husband back. I arrived at the office later than usual and there was a lot of activity. Everyone from temps to secretaries to agents scurried around as if their jobs depended on it. I wanted to hustle too, but I didn't really understand what my job involved other than satisfying Smith as required. Then I wondered what my dad would think of my destiny for greatness. I know my mom would feel about her. She would say quietly because my mother never yelled or even raised her voice. Well, Katie, you succeeded and failed at the same time. Mom always liked to start with something positive. You've succeeded beyond your wildest dreams in several areas, so good on you, girl. You failed in one minor area, so we'll have to be more careful next time, she'd say. Let's look at your progress first. In terms of pushing away the only person who loved you more than your dad and me, you did well, good job. In terms of becoming the biggest slut in the area, you've done well, good job. In terms of saving your marriage, well, we'll probably have to write it off as a loss, but we'll do better next time. I could hear my mom saying this as if she was standing right next to me. Before I could start crying again, the door to Smith's office opened and I heard screams from inside as one of the secretaries ran out of the room, closing the door behind her. Don't go in there, she warned. One of the partners, a family member, is telling Smith off. I thought Smith was a partner, I said. The woman ran away laughing. A few minutes later, the door opened again, and I heard a snippet of conversation. And do something with your face. You look like a damn clown. I saw Smith walk out, following the smaller man. The man had graying hair and was wearing a very cheap suit. His shoes were not expensive or polished. Compared to Smith, he looked like a homeless person, but he exuded a sense of power like I had never seen. He spoke or nodded politely to everyone he met, regardless of their status. He was even polite to the elevator operator. Where have I seen this behavior before? It was the way Rafe acted. He was polite to everyone we met. I used to do this too until I became important. Smith saw me and beckoned me to join him in the office. Who was that? I asked. We don't have time for questions now, he replied sharply. For some reason, we were taken out of the circle. Something serious happened with Amanda, and as her representative from the agency, I should have known about it first and dealt with the problem. That little idiot Marcel came here and told me that something was going on, but when I called that bitch, she said everything was fine. Now there are new developments, she wants to renegotiate the terms, and she called the main office. 
Brandon has just been here. He smells money and he's never wrong, Smith said. The fact that she wants to renegotiate also means she has something new, he said, hesitating. According to Brandon, she hinted that she might move to another agency because we weren't doing our damn jobs. I need to do something to fix what happened, but I don't know what. If I won't be able to, or, God forbid, I'll lose this order, I could end up on the street, he said seriously. But what will you do? I asked. What do we do? He answered sharply. If I leave, you will leave too. So get your head out of your ass, stop worrying about your red-faced husband, and get to work, he snorted. It was the first time he spoke to me in such a tone and manner. I didn't like it, and again the comparison between him and Rafe was obvious. Smith, the educated, wealthy man I had idealized when I was frustrated with business concerns, began speaking to me with veiled threats, like I was a non-entity. Why was this even important to him? He told me so many times that it was all just a game. He had millions of dollars and didn't need income. On the other hand, even when Rafe's life was crumbling around him because of my betrayal, he never spoke to me like that. I realized that Rafe probably knew about me and Smith and continued to come home and be polite, even knowing what I had done to him. He did this in the hope that I would return to him. I was a fool. Maybe she called and needed something and we weren't there. It could have happened yesterday while we were at your doctor's appointment, I said. Yes, said Smith. It is quite possible. And this is an angle we can use, he said, trying to smile. My face might even help us. I'll go to her and let her see me like this. She's not like you. She's a woman, so she'll sympathize, he said sharply. I will explain to her that this injury was the reason why I couldn't be with her, he said. Smith leaned back in his chair and motioned me toward his desk. He turned his chair to give me access and pointed to his zipper. Smith... The last time we got caught was just yesterday, I complained. Then lock the door and come here, he said. But, I tried to start. Smith interrupted my speech with his gaze. I should have expected this. The little man, Brandon, had taken away his power, so Smith needed to dominate someone else in order to feel good about himself. It wasn't about sex, I told myself, but still, I knew it was wrong. A knock on the door saved me. I quickly walked over and opened it. The woman from earlier burst in carrying some papers. That's all I got, she said excitedly. Looks like she has a new concept and a partner for something very radical. How radical can painting be? asked Smith. I don't know. They don't give you information, the woman said. That is, they don't give you the information, Smith replied sharply. No. When I mentioned your name, they went silent, the woman said. Before that, everyone was excited and talking. They're building a private room and charging extra for entry. The second entry fee will be donated to charity. So there's a lot of buzz about it, she said. Several critics who saw the photos of the exhibition were delighted, and she and her new partner put it all together in one night, the woman said. Maybe Miss Jenkins can help you the woman said, pointing at me. How the hell can she help? asked Smith. The woman turned around and started to leave the room, stopping only when Smith loudly asked, Where are you going? I don't have to put up with this kind of treatment from you, Mr. Benson. I don't work for you. I work for the firm, she said sharply. I'm sorry, Smith said. Please, I'm just upset. Forgive me, he whined. Well, Miss Jenkins, your husband is supervising the construction of a special exhibition room she said. They probably need a good contractor to make sure they do everything Amanda wants, she continued. He's so cute, she said, smiling at me, and then walked away. It seemed like everyone but me saw that my husband was special, I thought. He's so sweet, Smith repeated after the woman left. If he's so damn cute, why did he do this to me? Okay, go out there and try to find out all the information you can get from Lil Abner, Smith said. I'll go and try to get back into that bitch's good graces. If there's money to be made here and we can pull it off, we'll come out on top, he said angrily. I went to an art gallery on the east side of town where there was going to be an exhibition in three days. There were a lot of cars around the venue and people were running around looking busy. I walked up to the door to enter and was stopped by security. What do you want? 
the place is closed to the public, said a very cultured-sounding man in a tight suit. The suit was tight because the man was a giant. I'm from the agency that represents Miss Anderson, and we need information, I said, showing my badge. Miss Anderson is out of place, the man said. Can I see Rafe Jenkins? I asked. Mr. Jenkins is very busy, the man said. Tell him it's his wife, I said, showing my badge again. He looked at it again, then gave my badge to the other giant man, spoke to him briefly, and left. The second man looked at me as if he was waiting for me to move so he could crush me. As I waited at the counter, I reflected on the irony of the situation. I neglected my husband and pushed him away from me, betraying his love for me in the worst possible way. I did it because I wanted to be like Smith and I thought Rafe just didn't fit into this world. And now I had to wait, begging him to agree to meet with me. A few minutes later, the first giant returned, his expression giving me no information. He politely returned my badge and smiled, wishing me a good day. When I moved towards the door, he blocked my passage. Mr. Jenkins doesn't want to be disturbed, he said. But, I faltered, I was getting ready to start pleading with him and watched as a teenager pulled up and got out of the car with bags from Burger Queen and entered the building. Rafe apparently ordered lunch. But, I started again. Have a nice day, ma'am, the guard repeated more firmly, gritting his teeth. While I was leaving in a depressed state, a car drove up to the entrance. It was a brand new 2011 Shelby GT500 Mustang convertible. The car was so loud that the sound of its exhaust drowned out the stereo. A small woman jumped out wearing a long blue tuxedo shirt with a green t-shirt underneath, pink sweatpants, and purple fuzzy slippers. Her face was angelic and radiant. It was Amanda. Only Amanda could dress like that in public and get away with it. Cool car, Amanda, said the giant. It's not mine, she smiled. It's a gift for my new partner. Amanda disappeared into the building. If she saw me waving to her, she didn't think much of it, but I'm sure she saw me. This meant that Smith's conclusion was correct. He was excluded for some reason. I wonder why I was excluded too. At least I had some information for him and an idea to talk about later. When I returned to the office to compare notes with Smith, he was in a terrible mood. He looked worried when he saw me entering his office. And what did Red Face Joe say? He asked. I visibly tensed when I heard him mention Rafe. I couldn't get to him, I said quietly. What? Smith flared up. We pay his damn checks. How dare he refuse to meet you? And you're his wife, he barked. No wonder you're so crazy about me. What did Amanda tell you? I asked. Her PA told me she was busy, Smith snapped. Have you tried talking to her on the phone? I asked. The PA answered all her calls and told me she went out and called her personal cell phone, Smith said tensely. So you called? I asked again. I don't have that number, he said mockingly. It seems like with all the increased publicity surrounding the new material, only those she deems important to the show are getting the number. People like Brandon, who I won't call to ask him, you saw how it would be. Her head of security has a number, her assistant has a number, her new partner has a number, Smith said. And, he told me sharply, your damn husband has a number. Well, that brings me to my idea, I said. Do you have an idea? Smith said incredulously. I wondered as he looked at me. Did he think I was so stupid? Why did he hire me? Yes, I said firmly. All artists and performers have managers and agents, right? I asked. Yes, of course, said Smith. Who introduces her new partner? I asked. I don't know, said Smith. I could see the wheels turning in his mind. He reached across the table and pulled me towards him. He started trying to unbutton my blouse while we were sitting there. I pulled away as if I had another idea. That was a good thing because the door opened and Brandon walked into the office. Smith turned pale when he saw Brandon. I don't think we've met, Brandon said politely, holding out his hand. Brandon Benson, this is my assistant, Kathleen Jenkins, Smith introduced formally. Uh, Jenkins? Any connection to Mr. Rafe Jenkins? Brandon asked. He's my husband, I said. Brandon looked at me much more closely and then simply said, Interesting. It suddenly occurred to me that he had seen me before or knew something that I didn't know. 
Would you excuse us, Miss Jenkins? Brandon asked. If you haven't picked out a dress for tomorrow's show or need to do something about it, it might be worth taking a half day off to do so, he said. I didn't know I was going to the show, I said. Oh, yes, you really should be there, he said. I have a feeling you'll be there one way or another, so why not look your best, he added. As I closed the door, I heard Brandon's voice change as he started yelling at Smith again. Perhaps he was so cruel to Smith because they were related. Smith was probably the black sheep of the family, and they expected the best from him and were harder on him because of it. But his idea was good. I really needed to look my best if I was going to go to the show, especially if there was a possibility that Rafe would be there. I didn't think he would, after all. He was just the head of a team of contractors, just an employee. But maybe he'll be there, working. And if he sees me dressed up like this, he'll know he still loves me. Then I could promise him that I had changed and that things would be much better between us. Amanda, I don't want a suit, I complained. But this is the one you want, she said. I had already learned over the past couple of days that if Amanda wanted something, she got it. This morning I got my hair cut, not at a reputable barber shop, but at one of those fancy salons where they serve cappuccino and all that crap. Although I must admit that my hair and face looked much neater, my scruffy, half-shaven beard was gone, and my beautiful face was as clean as a baby's. And Amanda hid my car. She said I could pick her up after the show. This was the way she convinced me to come on the show in the first place. Now I was driving her around in an amazing car. This was a Mustang that had to be seen to be believed. It was a midnight blue Shelby GT 500 convertible. Honestly, I didn't even miss the truck while I was driving it. Being with Amanda took my mind off all my problems with Katie. Her lawyers worked with mine to make sure everything regarding the divorce would go smoothly. She, with her artistic nature, made sure that I could take revenge on Smith without resorting to violence again, and at the same time avoid prison. It was also a longer-term revenge that turned out to be much more satisfying. He took the most important thing from me, my marriage, and destroyed it. So we took what was most important to him and did the same. But back to the suit. Amanda. George says he never wears suits, even when he met the president, I said. Okay, Rafe Jenkins. When your band sells $50 million worth of records, you can stop wearing suits too, she said with a smile. But for now, this is your first show as an artist, and you need to make a good impression. And this costume will look perfect, complementing our overall performance. The blue of the suit really brings out the light blue of your eyes, she said, looking at me. I am an artist? I said, when did this happen? The day you set the art world on fire by completing my paintings, she said. Why else do you think we did all this? She asked. I thought I was working as your driver to pay you back for ruining the paintings, I said. I thought that was why you made me drive your car. Rafe Jenkins, you're amazing, she said laughing. What's so funny? I asked. It's not my car, she said. It's yours. My car, I said. I can't afford a car like this. Your share of our first painting will more than pay for the car, she said. If not, this will be my gift to you. Now try on the jacket. No ties, Amanda. I won't wear a tie. The night before the show seemed ominous. Now I understood what my high school teacher meant when he talked about the sword of Damocles hanging over someone's head. My last-minute dress was perfect. It was a shade of green that complemented my blonde hair. My back was exposed all the way up to my waist, so there was no chance of wearing a bra under my dress. The front part was very deeply carved. Rafe always said that I had an open chest, and I showed it when I wore these dresses. I was hoping he would be there tonight to see them. Even if he couldn't forgive me right away, I was going to play all my cards. I just wanted, no needed, my husband to come back. If he wants, I'll quit, and we can go home and just start having all those kids he wanted. Whatever it takes, from this night onwards, my main priority will be him. When I bought the dress, I noticed something. Maybe it was the onset of middle age, or my sedentary lifestyle, or just eating too much rich food. But I was larger than average and had to let the dress out. 
The seamstress also added elastic in the middle to help tighten my belly. My butt had never been my defining feature, but now it was a little lower than before and less firm. It didn't matter that I was going to the gym tomorrow. I looked good tonight. Smith picked me up in a limousine. He gave me the bored, rich guy look that I initially thought was so cool. You know how some people can get together or do the most exciting thing and brush it off like they're not having a good time. They act like they're too cool for the room. Well, tonight, after seeing him up close, I wonder what I even saw in him. I mean, how fucking stupid I was. He's 50, he's balding, I'm stronger than him, and he's boring. He doesn't care about me and uses me like a thing. For this, I abandoned my young husband, who worshipped the ground I walked on. When he closed the partition in the limo and reached for my chest, I pulled away from him. His time was up, but he just didn't know it. He sulked for the rest of the trip, and I could tell he was on edge. Not having sex before a performance was the least of his problems, and he knew it too. We were both hoping for a miracle, but it wasn't necessarily the same thing. Our first problem came when we got to the venue and didn't have VIP passes, which meant that even though we arrived early, our limo couldn't pull up to the building. There were TV crews and reporters filming and photographing actors, rock stars, art critics, etc., who had VIP passes. We ended up having to walk almost four blocks and then go through the side entrance. From where we were waiting to enter, we could see the VIP entrance. I saw a few people I saw on TV and stuff. I even thought I saw George Solomon, the leader and lead singer of Rising Rocks. They were my favorite band. With him was a six-foot-tall, 90-pound Swedish supermodel. I didn't have a chance to look because there was a distinct rumble and people started screaming. Then, out of nowhere, a dark blue Mustang came into view. The top was down, the valet opened the doors, and Amanda stepped out and removed the beautiful blue silk scarf she wore to protect her hair. Her hair was combed back and shiny. Every time the light fell somewhere near her, you could see its reflections. Her makeup was flawless, but not too flawless. The dark blue eyeshadow matched her dress and that damn car. Her dress was raw silk and beautiful. It followed her every curve, highlighting what she had and hiding what she didn't have. Her breasts, although small, are clearly visible. Her ass, although fully covered, was clearly present, her every step serving only to notify the audience that she was there. The dress was several inches longer than mid-calf, but the daring slit at the back offered a tantalizing look. With the exception of a small window at chest level, the woman was completely covered from the neck to just above the ankles. It was clearly her show, and everyone could see it. When I saw Amanda's escort, presumably her mysterious new partner, alarm bells started ringing in my head. I only saw him from behind when he got out of the car and lovingly took Amanda's hand as if it were the most precious thing he had. She looked into his eyes with complete devotion. No one else mattered here except the two of them. I was surprised when George Solomon ran up to them and patted his new partner on the back, and then they began playfully boxing with each other for the reporters. They were obviously having a good time here, unlike some people, I thought, looking at Smith. These people knew how to live. Amanda's new partner was probably more than just her partner, and he was friends with rock stars and God knows who else. His hair was cut just right, and his suit, he had a very long jacket, almost like a frock coat. It was the same midnight blue raw silk as Amanda's dress. When we finally entered the building, I couldn't stop thinking about Amanda's man. Damn, I thought to myself. Why the hell am I worrying about Amanda's man when I should be trying to find mine? Smith, I'm going to look around the back of the venue a little bit, I said. He simply snorted and nodded his head. He was also looking for something or someone. I went backstage and tried to get into the VIP room, but I couldn't. Smith and I, as representatives of the agency, would be in the VIP room for the special exhibition, but we were not allowed to enter the early viewing of the new works until the actual show began. It was reserved for beautiful people and the very rich. Who cares? I'm tired of rich people. I tapped one of the guards on the shoulder and asked him if any contractor employees would be on site that evening in case of an emergency. He said, almost all of them will. 
He also told me that I could find them downstairs on the lower level playing cards and laughing at their boss. I wondered why they were laughing at my husband, but they were probably just a group of good-natured guys making fun of Rafe for his nervousness before the show. I failed him again because I was so busy with my own problems that I didn't consider that this was his dream. This was what he considered success, having his own contractor business and doing important things like tonight, and I wasn't here to share it with him. I went downstairs and received several whistles and shouts at my dress. I smiled despite everything. It's always nice to be appreciated. I wondered again what Rafe would think when he saw me. I looked around but didn't see him. Hey guys, is Rafe Jenkins here? I asked. Not down with the workers this evening, answered one of them. Yeah, Rafe is doing his other thing. They all laughed. When I left, I heard them talking about me. Damn, Rafe won all the women tonight, one of them said. And all kinds, added another. That's my type. I like slutty girls, said the voice. I returned to our section and watched as people continued to enter. Most of them looked at Amanda's paintings. They were beautiful, and most of them had already been sold, although the show in the other room had not yet started. I approached Smith. What's wrong? He barked. You couldn't find Barney Fife? I didn't say a word. I just stood there and fumed. Rafey was worth a thousand Smiths. I was just thinking about how glad I was that Rafe had tackled that idiot to the ground when a voice over the loudspeaker announced that the special show was about to start. All those present with tickets to the VIP event lined up at the entrance to the inner room, showed their tickets, and went inside. The room was organized differently. Unlike many of the paintings in the other room, there were only seven paintings here. These paintings were covered so we couldn't see them. I almost stopped breathing when I saw George Solomon sitting in the front row, which was partitioned off. Apparently even the VIP room had different sections. I wonder how much money it cost to sit in that front row. The presenter began to speak. That's often what separates a great artist from a merely good one. He then paused. It's the ability to put emotion into their work and the ability to reach their viewers. These artists have the ability to make people react and experience personal feelings when they look at a painting or see a sculpture or hear a song, he said. Artists like this come along very rarely, he continued. I saw hundreds of camera flashes and video cameras trying to get the best angle. The doors were left slightly open and people outside peered in. I knew this was intentional because all four doors to the room were similarly half open. This should have made those who were outside pay twice as much to be here next time and those who were here now would remember it forever. Smith seemed to be trying to stay as far away from me as his chair would allow, which was strange even for him. He usually went out of his way to show other men that we were together. Tonight, the announcer continued, we have the privilege of being here to present the latest work of one of these extremely talented artists, who herself is at a crossroads in her career. I present to you the one and only Amanda Anderson. When Amanda's small figure appeared on stage, all eyes in the audience turned to her. She walked up to the podium, holding flashcards in her hands. It was almost like being at an award ceremony where she had a lot of people to thank. She exuded confidence. Her every move was photographed and will be the talk of watering machines around the world tomorrow. She smiled widely, causing another flurry of flashes, then stepped out from behind the podium so she could once again be photographed from all angles. Shouts of Amanda echoed throughout the hall as everyone there tried to get her attention. Tonight I offer you my latest and greatest works, she said in heavily accented English. I had heard Amanda speak a few times and knew that her accent wasn't usually that strong. She clearly played the exotic French artist trope to the extreme. Tonight I will show you a complete artistic experience that will provide you with raw emotions in several paintings. But before we begin the auction, I must invite to the stage some of the people who supported us and made our presence here tonight possible, she said. From the Benson Management Agency, please Brandon Benson, Smith Benson, and Kathleen Jenkins. Come to the stage, she asked. I couldn't believe Amanda mentioned my name. I stood up as if in a trance and headed towards the podium. Smith smiled from ear to ear. He gestured toward the camera and whispered to me, the bitch is giving us recognition, 
that might be a good thing. When we reached the stairs, Smith walked straight up the steps to the stage, and Brandon bowed and motioned for me to go forward. When we got on stage, several cameras flashed and I looked straight into the camera lens. I hoped that Rafe and perhaps my family back home could see me now. There were also many large screens throughout the room to show what was happening on stage. I noticed that there were more people on stage than Amanda had called for, but I wasn't worried about that. They all had large brown envelopes in their hands. Maybe they were going to present some awards. I got into the spirit of the event and waved to no one in particular. Amanda started talking again. When I arrived in California two months ago, Smith turned pale when she said, two months ago. We thought she had only been here a week or two. This was probably part of the reason she was unhappy with us. I was upset, Amanda continued. My career was at a standstill and I didn't know what to do next. I did a lot of paintings in France that were sold tonight. They're good, and I was proud of them at the time, but I knew I needed to take the next step. But alas, I did not know what he would be like until the person you are about to meet came into my life. I felt a tingling sensation all over my body at the thought of standing next to Amanda's mysterious partner. Again, I thought, worrying about someone else's man when I should have been looking for my own. The first thing he did was give me a friend, she said as the crowd sighed and gasped. Then he showed me the joy in simple things and the magic of different flavors. He taught me to appreciate, uh, like, Burger Queen, she said. My head whipped around and I turned to Amanda. Some people around us noticed this and Smith grabbed my hand. I was stunned and had a bad feeling that I was going to get into a fight soon. Let me introduce you to my new partner, and hopefully not just in business. She smiled at the cameras. Rafe Jenkins, she said. My head exploded. Smith opened his mouth, and I almost fell at the same time. Brandon nudged Smith and nodded toward a short, plump woman in a rumpled suit with wrinkled stockings on the edge of the other side of the stage. Smith paled noticeably, and I swear I could hear his heartbeat. My husband Rafe walked onto the stage smiling. He looked better than ever. His hair looked like a million dollars. His scruffy beard was gone, and his handsome face was smooth. Those steel blue eyes lit up the room, and they seemed to see only Amanda. Then I saw him give the OK sign to George Solomon and stand next to Amanda. He didn't even spare me a glance. I tried to start moving away from the podium, but I was pinched on both sides. Rafe taught me to add raw pain and emotion to my or our art she said. As soon as Amanda said this, Rafe raised his hands. I noticed two things. As soon as Rafe raised his hands, the curtains over the painting slowly began to rise and the coverings on the floor receded. The second thing I noticed was that when Rafe's hands dropped, Amanda took his hand. Smith turned to look at me when I heard a growl. Then I realized it was me. The crowd screamed as one. A picture opened before us, both grotesque and stunning. She was powerful, beautiful. It was a mess all at once. There was a long, almost too long, moment of silence. Then the crowd rose to its feet as one and began to applaud. Amanda had little tears in her eyes and the cameras loved it. I couldn't believe this shit. This is art? What the hell? Some of the paintings weren't even finished. They were of me, Smith, and us together. There was one that appeared to be a Burger Queen employee. And there was that same rumpled little woman standing at the other end of the stage. There were paint splatters on all of them. Some had many colors, others only one color. I didn't understand this. But every time I looked at them, it captured my heart. Watch, if you like, Amanda began, a play of broken love about a faithful and loving man whose wife willingly gives herself to a man who is not even worthy to kiss his ass, Amanda blurted out angrily. See also the worm's wife, feel her pain, feel her sadness, as her love is rejected for the last time. Amanda was in her element, controlling the crowd's reaction. Look at the pain that a simple act of betrayal brings to them all, she said, as if she was in pain herself. The woman was the master of the show, and she had the crowd in the palm of her hand. The only thing I could think about was that the little bitch needed two beatings, one for stealing my husband and one for calling it art. I needed to get out of there as quickly as possible. There were exclamations and gasps throughout the room. Then people started recognizing us and looking at me and Smith angrily. 
Again, I tried to run from the room, but they stopped me. Where are you going, Kathleen? Amanda asked from the podium. There's still a lot to do here, and we'll have gifts for both of you later. As she said this, I saw huge guards come and stand behind Smith and me to make sure we couldn't leave. Brandon looked at Smith with fire in his eyes. Asshole, Brandon began. You're fired, he said so loudly that everyone could hear. The little woman walked up to Smith and hit him so hard that it reverberated throughout the room. She reached out to me but could not get past the huge guards. Smith's first painting opened the auction. The initial bid was $100,000. The painting was sold for almost double the price. A painting of a rumpled woman, who I finally realized was Smith's wife, sold for a quarter of a million dollars. Other paintings, including two of me, also sold for high prices. The one that didn't rise above the opening bid was a picture of the boy from Burger Queen. Then Amanda suggested dinner with her and Rafe, as well as a personal explanation of how the boy connected to the story and suddenly the bids skyrocketed for him. Then Amanda and Rafe raised their hands again and the room fell silent. Before we begin the finale of the evening, Amanda said, we would like to present the most significant work. The lighting brightened and the final picture, Rafe standing alone with several intense splashes of paint, was revealed. The cameras immediately started flashing. There were a few oohs and oh craps heard. It was obviously the masterpiece of the collection. Amanda has clearly surpassed her previous level of skill in this film. I swear I could see her breathing and feel the pain in her eyes. When I saw this picture, I realized how much I hurt him. I also realized that I had no chance of getting him back. Who can forgive someone he loved so much but who treated him as poorly as I did? I didn't deserve his forgiveness. Bidding for Rafe's painting started at a million dollars and reached almost 1.3 million. At the end of the auction, some of those present stood up. They were brought back to their places by Rafe's voice. We have another item up for auction tonight, he said. One that even Amanda doesn't know about. I'd like you all to look at the screens around the room, he said. As we watched, a video began showing a room in which paintings were clearly visible on easels, as if they were being worked on. Rafe entered the room and saw the paintings. You could see the pain and shock on his face as he moved from one painting to the next. I knew it had to be the day he caught Smith with his hand up my skirt, because I recognized the same look I had seen then. Next, Rafe is seen grabbing an open can of paint and throwing it at the canvas. You could hear him scream as he did it again, and then collapse to the floor. Then Amanda came into the room and didn't even look at the paintings. At her work, she only looked at the person in front of her and how she could ease his pain. Everyone in the room sighed as she handed him another can of paint and directed him towards the work she had poured her heart and soul into. Rafe threw can after can at the paintings, and it simply fed him more and more paint until he ran out of paint. She then sat down next to him and began stroking his head. Then the video stopped and Rafe said, This is real security camera footage of the making of these paintings. It is an art in itself, he said. There is only one copy and it will not be reproduced. It would be a great addition to the collection of someone who already has one or more paintings, he continued. But it would also be a great standalone piece. The video sold for two million dollars to the person who bought Rafe's painting. Amanda walked up to the podium again and an army of little people in suits stood with her. Now we have special gifts for some very special people, Amanda said. One neatly dressed woman walked up to the podium and said, Katie Jenkins. I was too shocked by the events of that night to react, so someone pointed at me. She came up to me and handed me an envelope. You've been served, she said. Another man called Smith and did the same. Then my name was called again, and so it continued. Rafe filed for divorce because of my infidelity. He also sued Smith for alienation of affection, which led to the end of our marriage, and he sued Benson's agency for not following their privacy rules. Smith's wife did the same thing to him and me, but she didn't sue the firm. She was Benson. She was part of the family. When she married Smith, he took her last name. He wasn't really Benson. Under the terms of their divorce, he even had to revert to his original last name. She also had a cast-iron marriage contract. He will be left penniless, without a home and without a job. 
He didn't even have his own car. Ray filed for divorce as soon as he found out about Smith and me. This was long before I thought about it. So I won't get a penny of his earnings from the painting auction tonight. I will receive essentially half of our joint property before he files, which will amount to nothing. I'll get half the sale price of his truck if he sells it. Or he can just give me half of its value, which is now pennies to him. I tried over the next few weeks to talk to Rafe. He refused. His lawyers made it clear to me that if I contested the divorce, even though they couldn't legally do so, they would post all the photos and videos they had, not only online, but also send a copy of the file to every person in my hometown, including my parents. I signed the papers. I thought I'd be able to talk to Rafe when he came to get his things, but he never came. I saw him and that little French homewrecker often. They were everywhere on television and in many magazines and newspapers. Rafe lived the life I always wanted and more, just without me. I fell into a long depression and stayed there until the money ran out. Then I decided to do the only thing I could, return home. I called my father and he was cold to me on the phone. It turned out that Rafe's lawyers didn't even need to release the files. The art show was broadcast around the world. Clips of him were everywhere on the internet. Of course, they didn't show any pictures of Smith and me, but everyone knew the story. I could never show my face anywhere again. Rafe, being true to himself, went home and told both our families the story and reason for our divorce to lessen the shock for them before it became world news. His parents adored Amanda, much more than they ever loved me. Even my parents loved her. Last I heard, Amanda was pregnant, and they had rented a boat and were slowly traveling around Europe in preparation for their next big art sale. It was to be her last because Amanda finally found what she was looking for. Unfortunately for me, it was my husband. Well, I have to go. My bus has arrived. As I already said, the biggest misfortune for women is men. The good ones are hard to find, and the bad ones are always in front of your eyes, pretending to be something they are not. Like I said, most of this really isn't my fault. Is it so? Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.